the French tried to build it initially, and because of malarial problems, you can see lots of low swampy water there, eventually gave up. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go! Resellers don't waste time. If there's an opportunity to shop, we take it. And here's a quick stop on the way to an appointment. Let's go inside and see what they've got there. This place is gigantic, so we're only going to scratch the surface. I think there's something like 150 dealers spread out in this place, but we'll take a look and see what they've got today. It's a nice entrance, actually. I mean, it's just a simple metal building on the freeway, but it's very visible. I remember driving by here 25 years ago, I think, and it was brand new then. And I came after dark, so I didn't get to stop, but I remember seeing the sign, and ever since I had in mind that I needed to come back here. And finally, last year I did, and it's a cool place. So here we are at Bright's Antique World, and it is about the size of the entire world, so there should be lots of things in there to see, and let's go look. So the very first thing you see when you walk in are booths going in all directions. And I oftentimes pick one direction and go that way. And usually I shop to the right, but today for fun, because I saw the right side last time, we're gonna shop to the left. See what we get this direction. This dealer is having a big sale, and I know that several of them are because they are reopened, and so it's a reintroduction to the store because things were closed for, gosh, just about three months. We talk about Fenton a lot, and usually I look for the production pieces from the mid-20th century or the carnival glass pieces from early on. But towards the end of their production, they did a lot of neat artware, especially painted pieces. The Burmese here, which was a very hard color to make because it goes to the satin and you've got that pink in there and that's always hard on the kilns and this is hand painted. Their artists would typically sign the bottoms and as it became more and more a staple of their business, they'd do some pretty elaborate marks on the bottom so that you knew what you were getting. A lot of these pieces sold for 85 to 150 new and most of them have about held their value. They're still selling in the range of their original issue price. The cat here is, with the discount, around $100. And this is not one that you see very often. And I'm not sure if you would call this jadeite. It's actually a little bit more of a, it's got a carnival iridescence on it. And I think it's actually more of a pale green than a real jade green, more like a celadon color. And it's winking at you, isn't that nice? I'm used to seeing Seaberg and Wurlitzer, but this is a United Hi-Fi, and this would have been right about 1960. High Fidelity was a new concept in stereo sound about that time, and Hi-Fi is the term that was used then, and that's where the term Wi-Fi was derived from when wireless came along. Uh, it's got your selectors here, so you could pick whatever was in the jukebox, which looks like a what is in there now are a bunch of 1950s and 60s records. I see Farron Young, who is somebody that I have not heard of, so before my time. But you could pick from polkas, popular music, hit tunes, and new releases. And then this down here was what's coming next, which I guess would have been heavy metal or fusion jazz or something like that and you got to put in a dime and get one play, or if you put in a quarter, you got three plays. And it's actually a lot of money to hear a song. The places that had the jukeboxes actually did very well back in the day. I'm gonna look at these bookends here. They're end of the trail and they're painted. And when you see painted, 
That's usually a better company like Pompeian Bronze or Armor Bronze from the 1920s. They're priced at 30 and I have customers who pay 60 to 75 dollars for similar so I'm going to take a look at those and I see they've got a few more pairs in here as well. They've also got some neat RCA Victor pieces with Nipper the dog. Nipper was the one who heard his master's voice on the phonograph and perked up his ears and so they made him into a logo. I suspect that this is an old-time dealer who is retiring because I noticed that the big machines over here to the right, the Victrolas and talking machines, are priced at half. And they've been here from the old days, I think, because the original prices are about double what things go for now. At half price, these are all pretty reasonable deals. This one at half price is 300 This is a little later. In the 1920s, they get shorter and they turn into more of a console. And that way you had a place to store your records. And you also had this, which is the speaker. And if it was too loud, you just shut one of the doors. And if it was way too loud, you shut the other door. That was your sound control back then. It was pretty basic. This one is going to be a little bit earlier. This is going to be around 1918. And these were very expensive when they were new. You'll notice they don't have the heads or any of the things that they need to play. They've locked those away in the showcases. And that's because, unfortunately, a lot of people who don't have those for their machines used to rip those off. And so dealers who know just put that stuff in a locking case. So when you see them and they look like they don't have all their parts, just ask because they're usually stored somewhere nearby. I wanted to show this sign because as an antique mall dealer myself, this is a pet peeve of ours. If you make an offer on something, don't do it unless you're serious about buying it because we really count on those sales if we say, gee, we'll take 20% off and you say, sure, and then we go in with a bunch of stuff and you didn't take the piece, then we're like, what do we do with all this stuff? So we really count on people to, you know, wait until you're serious, then make an offer and we'll do our best for you. I like the stuff on it, but the card itself really grabs my attention. These chrome with the wheels, if it's got the metal wheels, that's going to tell you that it's older. So this is going to be original from about 1970. It's similar to a designer piece that was done in the time, but it is not the same maker. But really great look. Unfortunately, not for sale. A lot of times fixtures in antique stores, even if it's an old thing, they're using it. And so unfortunately, they won't let this one go because otherwise it'd be in my car. <laughs> So if you ever watch Real Nifty Vintage with Jeffrey, he talks a lot about Franciscan ivy, and it is a really good pattern and a pretty collectible pattern. This was the stuff they used on the I Love Lucy show. They also did Franciscan apple, which we have some down here. Same company, all of these are embossed and then hand painted. On I Dream of Genie, this was the pattern. Every show had its own dinnerware pattern, and if you collect American dinnerware from the mid 20th century, if you look at the different shows, you probably will spot something familiar. On I Dream of Genie, there's an episode where someone asks for half a cup of coffee, and this floats by. They actually cut one in half and somehow filmed it. I'm sure they had glass in it with coffee floating by the screen. And then, well, the Franciscan Ivy came out as a pattern in 1948. A lot of other companies caught on to the Ivy craze in the 50s. These particular pieces are by Glassbake. They look similar to Pyrex, but they're a different company. But they've got a nice Ivy pattern on, too. Ivy was definitely a popular pattern in the 50s. And then we've got Amish Butterprint. This is a Pyrex pattern. And you can see the difference in the color and the shape just a little bit. The narrower handles on the bowl are Pyrex, the wider handles are the glass bake. The quality of the milk glass is a little better on the Pyrex. This is a little thin and watery looking, whereas this is more opaque. Now this one's been restored, but this is a Miller Glass Company slag glass lamp. 
uh, slag glass because it's like stained glass but it's opaque and it kind of looks like those agate marbles from the 1930s and 40s. Miller was one of the big companies. Pearpoint did big puffy lamps like this. Theirs are some of the most valuable as well as Tiffany. Tiffany really was the progenitor of the style and people copied after that. This one is priced at 700. For this size with these colors and this much detail, that's about a fair retail price these days. And it's been rewired, but they did use the original cloth wire and the original style plug. You can actually get these types of things from ordering online. So if you are restoring a lamp, you can do it properly and not put a new plug on an old lamp. These little cabinets seem very plain. Sometimes you'll see a decal or a little painted adornment. But these were very important in American households up until really the 1930s when built-in cupboards became more the standard. This is called a chimney cupboard or a pantry cupboard. These were usually an add-on with a kitchen queen. So you'd have the kitchen queen, then you'd have the stove. There was usually a chimney and there'd be a notch next to the chimney and that's where this would set. And it was just to have extra storage space in the kitchen. And that's what people use it for now, extra storage space. They usually price in the $100 to $150 range these days. So while I'm thinking of it, please comment in the space below here and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. We see a lot of calendar plates that have advertising. This one happens to advertise a furniture store in Ohio. But the significant thing about this is this is one of the last years you see them. It's 1915, and it's because that's the year the Panama Canal opened. The Panama Canal was a big, long ordeal. The French tried to build it initially, and because of malarial problems, you can see lots of low swampy water there. They eventually gave up the project. Our country was going to build one through Nicaragua, which I believe is where the Chinese are now building it. But we ended up doing it in Panama instead. In fact, we created a civil disturbance so that Panama broke off from Colombia and became its own country. And that's why we had control of the canal zone for so many years. So this is an interesting piece of history and these little plates sell usually for 15 to $20. This one's marked at 1995. So we're at one of the many intersections at Bright's Antique World and you can see there are a ton of spaces behind, a ton of spaces that way. This is a very large antique mall and we will definitely need to come back and continue to shoot here because to get all of this is going to take some time. This place is huge, interesting, and has lots of fun stuff. They're open seven days a week. Bright's Antique World in Franklin, Kentucky. Naturally, I took the opportunity to make the return trip too, but I decided to hit a new mall this time. Down the road from Bright's is Flea Land in Bowling Green. I never seem to get here on Saturday and Sunday. It says it's Kentucky's biggest indoor flea market, and that may be true, advertising things like rugs and music, so I think it's a lot of new stuff. But there are some antique dealers who set up outside by the Antique Mall, and the Antique Mall is open every day. And I gotta tell you, it's a good store. I've been here several times. The People who run it are very professional, it's clean, it's nice, there's good stuff, and I usually find something I can buy. We are going to head on in and see what we can find. Here's the first thing I like, of course it's big. It appears to be a stool with a mirror in the back, and I'm trying to figure out what the form would be. It's definitely old. It has the same sort of twist as an old iron ice cream chair from maybe the 1920s. I imagine maybe it was a shaving stand and that was actually used as a seat behind it for a bachelor, like a valet. Interesting, I haven't seen that shape before. I'll have to ask about that. These foes have a lot of the little stuff that I enjoy. The political pins here are post-war. The pre-war ones are the more valuable, though. 
Their prices are fair too. Not really a lot for resale in this space usually, but I'm sure if you picked through it, you would probably find something. I don't have a lot of time today, unfortunately. There is a market for die cast, even newer, but there's a lot of brittle in here. I look for the American made, personally. I wonder what they might take for this. It's a very useful little thing and it's got some style even though it's plastic. 1960s, I would guess. And these pull out. It could be pretty useful to somebody. I'm definitely interested in this. These have come out of labs, so they're fairly common, but they're pretty neat, and people really like them. And this one's all copper. It's got a good label. It's not wildly old, though, but it's still probably old enough. It's $18. I think they might do a discount if I bundle, so I'm going to take a couple things up and see what we can do. Good looking fan, but $45 is definitely the price it should be. Ooh, in the middle of the pink, it's a Florida glass. Let's see how much this is. Oh yeah, I'll take that. This is cute. It's $25. I'm sure somebody out there would probably buy it if it was cleaned up. But it's big and it's plastic. Smart display. That yellow grinding wheel makes me think that this is an interesting space because there's a focal point. So let's see what's in here. Welcome to booth 18. 50% off anything with this paw print. Let's see what this is about. I see stuff I like in here. This old spur for $30 is pretty cool looking. It's too bad there aren't a pair, but it'd be a lot more if there were. Brass cat is cute. A lot of small dark metal objects in here, so let's find an eye catcher so that we can focus our attention on something. How much is the radio? That could be a good piece. Is it underneath? $20. Hmm. It's not really a bad price. Traffic lights have really gone up in price since I first had one. This one's about double what I used to pay. Where are the paw prints? Haven't found anything with a paw print yet, but here we go. 30 bucks, so that'd be 15. That's probably worth it. It doesn't have the flower bin. Should be four pieces, but still might be worth getting. Okay, am I reading this right? Does this have the paw print? It does. It was 125. That's a very good one. The shape is interesting. The frame is good. I don't know if there's enough room in it. This place does have a bunch of vintage books. Looks like mid-century stuff. It's always rough when I'm trying to go through a store in a quick hurry because I know that there's deals in here that I would be finding if I was able to take more time. But I just have the time allotted between dropping off and picking up my friend from his appointment, so this is how we quickly shop in an antique mall. Focusing on the big stuff is helpful. That's a Roseville pitcher. I like that a lot. Pretty lamps. Some of these are older than what we usually see. Gone with the Wind lamps were made by Fenton as late as the 1990s and as early as the 1940s. Ooh, 25% off. Well, let's look at this. Speaking of Fenton, mm, yeah, 65 minus 25% is a nice deal for a collector, but not really a bargain for me.
A lot of glass and china in this booth, but I'm looking for things for shows that are going to stand out. I've got plenty of glass and china right now. Let's see what we have here. Uranium glass, that always jumps out. Prices are fair, but nothing that I can really turn. I like the shape of the corner cabinet, and look at that nice old set of carnival glass. This picture set, you can see the softness and the iridescence. It's a Northwood set that's priced at $260. Now look how shiny this is by comparison. This is an Imperial set from about 1970. That's the difference between antique carnival glass and 1960s and 70s carnival glass. Funny to see this here. I always think of that episode of that 70s show where they mock this band. Well, if I'm going to buy this, I'm going to have to plug it in really fast and see if it works. These are from the early 80s, but they are definitely collectible now. $45 seems like the right price to me, so I'm going to leave it. The other one didn't work as it turned out. Unfortunate, but that happens sometimes. You have to check because it is all sales final. This is a really cool thing. Louisville and Nashville. Embossed. Next to it you have a normal style with the ruby inter, which is nice. Also L and M. New York Central here. People do still collect these, but the prices are down, so you have to be careful what you pay for them. I still think they're amazing, though. They represent this huge change in the way people communicated, got around, and connected. Yeah, those look like nice drapery she's getting. Wow, I ended up with a bunch of stuff for a really quick stop. I wish I had more time. Always like the Flea Land Antique Mall. The fellow is very nice, but the guy you saw has been here for a long time and they just do a great job. Well, speed shopping is fun. I found a little at the first place and a little more at the second place, and there's always room for one more. So thank you for joining me here at Flea Land. It was a fun day running up and down I-65 in Kentucky and looking for stuff. It's good to be with you. I am on social media as you see below. Please subscribe so that you can ring that bell and get notified of future videos. Please thumbs up this video, leave a comment, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!